Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Unbounded, brought to you by Deloitte Unlimited Reality. My name is Francis Yu, and I'm the general manager for our Unlimited business um, and otherwise known as the uh, Metaverse business. So you might ask, why Unbounded? Because shaping the future is pretty hard. And what's harder is challenging our own assumptions and unbounding what we thought things should be done. So joining me today, I have three colleagues joining me today. Jessica. Jessica Kosmowski and I have the pleasure of leading Deloitte's TMT business, which I affectionately call our tech, media, telecom, entertainment, and sports business. Thanks for having me. And this is uh, Nitin Mehta, and I lead our AI business in Deloitte. And I am very much looking forward to this discussion with respect to the unlimited uh, promise that the metaverse represents, as well as the mixed reality world that we live in today. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Alan Cook. I lead our digital reality practice for all things AR, VR, 360, and spatial. So thank you, Jessica, Nitin, and Alan. So today, well, the, for the Unbounded, our topic is around uh, how might enterprise unleash unbound value in metaverse. Now, metaverse is a 50-year-old term and has gained so much discussion attention uh, today. Now, why is it today? Why is that, right? So today, our first, we're going to have three topics today. The first topic is all about unpacking why now. The second topic is around where to play. And the last topic, we're going to do a three-minute boxing round to talk about what are some of the uh, orthodoxes we have to challenge in order to capture value in enterprise metaverse. So let's start with the first topic, why now? Um, as I talked about, Metaverse has been work in progress over the past decade. And what's interesting is we're seeing that there is the convergence of technologies, the crescendo around this whole immersive spatial web, around the spatial web interacts and enabling a whole set of social interactions. You might argue that spatial web has gone social, and that also intersects with whole sets of culture moments, create economy. And a lot of that really starts with the uh, media, entertainment, uh, technology business, uh, telecom business, think about 5G, et cetera. So Jessica, you being an insider of the Silicon Valley, you being the leader who leads this um, um, portfolio of business for us. So can you just help our listeners, our viewers today to unpack a bit uh, what's happening and what's real around this whole thing called enterprise metaverse. Absolutely. Thank you, Francis. As I look through this domain through the lens of my role, there has never been a more exciting time in my career. We're essentially looking at the next evolution of the internet. And these kinds of changes happen once in a generation, changing the industry structure and creating new leaders. Every aspect of tech, media, and telecom ecosystem is in for a major change in the next few years. There's an opportunity for so many things. There's an opportunity for tremendous innovation in every area. Media companies will need to develop new business models, engage consumers with new content and virtual experiences. Products and services will be reimagined at every layer of the technology stacks from apps to consumer hardware to sensors to dev platforms, and the integration of centralized and decentralized architectures. Further, the evolution of 5G means that many of these immersive experiences can actually be enjoyed with great fidelity to every consumer at last mile limitations, as last mile limitations get, to get addressed with high bandwidth and edge architectures, delivering high performance applications to end consumers on demand. This will significantly aid the adoption of metaverse use cases and create new revenue streams for telcos and beyond. 
the TMT industry is not just going to change in and of itself, but it will also be a huge enabler for all industries in realizing the value of the metaverse. Now, that's a lot of optimism, a lot of hope, right? Um, I love it. And then this interesting part you mentioned, it's a, the convergence of number of underlying technologies across the interaction layer, the com computation layer, and also the information layer. Now on that, Nitin, you drive and lead the AI growth business for Deloitte. You also work with a whole range of uh, large enterprises and startups alike in shaping the AI agenda. So could you just unpack a bit in terms of what do you see as the role of AI in shaping the value in metaverse? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, frankly, the key is what uh, Jessica and you kind of uh, outlined. The key is that we are actually seeing a convergence of technologies, whether it is AI meets a graphical processing unit or GPU semiconductor chip meets a AR VR uh, that uh, frankly has progressed uh, over the period of time meets a blockchain as well as the proliferation of cryptocurrencies and now NFTs. There's a lot of basically such kind of technologies that have been uh, converging, which uh, have given the rise as well as uh, the possibility of the advancements that could be made in an immersive world. But specifically, how are clients thinking about it? How are they basically kind of contemplating their progress uh, with respect to the metaverse? and then the role of AI in that context. What I would sort of highlight is three possibilities. One is in the context of B2C, where businesses are engaging consumers. The second is in the context of B2B, in terms of how organizations think about the application of AI in the metaverse for themselves as an enterprise. And the third is in the context of B2E, which is with respect to how do businesses create the environment uh, for their own employees? When it comes to kind of the world of B2C, we are absolutely seeing the advent of virtual commerce, social commerce, as well as uh, um, the virtual possibilities as it relates to either sporting events, as it relates to concerts, as it relates to entertainment, and much of it, frankly, has been propelled by the industry that Jessica actually leads. That is kind of where we see the buzz right now. And frankly, that is where the media's attention and uh, perhaps uh, people's attention is. The second possibility is with respect to B2B. How do organizations apply AI in a virtual world for themselves? This is the world of sophisticated simulation. Simulating a physical environment, a science accurate physical environment, whether it is basically kind of simulating the test track for autonomous vehicles, whether it is simulating, for example, investments that energy companies may be looking for as they transition from fossil fuel to green energy, simulating the home healthcare experience that uh, healthcare providers and care providers around the world are trying to kind of make progress on. Simulating the physical world before you actually make investments in the world and consequently advance your aspirations. The third possibility is for your employees. Mm. Employees are the lifeblood of an organization, the talent, the skill set, the passion that they actually kind of represent. Thinking about how you could create an immersive learning environment for them. What is going to be the culture and the form and nature of human connectivity in a immersive world, AKA a metaverse? Organizations are absolutely thinking about uh, how they could engage their employees, how they could create the experience and how they could create an a immersive learning uh, environment for their own employees in a B2E context. This is kind of where sophisticated forms of AI, particularly advancements in deep neural networks that essentially require the underlying accelerated computing 
and the promise of a GPU semiconductor chip is coming to the forefront. And mm -hmm. that is kind of where the promise is, and that is perhaps all the set of possibilities that exist for uh, enterprises. Yeah. Nitin, I really love how you framed up as the B2C, B2B, and B2E, and really the, what you highlighted in terms of the talent aspect is so significant. Now, speaking of the, uh, the human aspect of all things we're talking about, right? I would say where there are hopes, there are fears. And I have never in the 20 years of uh, professional services uh, experience, I've never heard, had so much like a heated debate around the hopes and fears in terms of where the moment in time we are in around computing science and some foundational fundamental shifts. Alan, you have been uh, evangelizing this spatial web concept and also evangelizing digital reality, virtual reality over the past decade. So tell us a bit in terms of what you're seeing, what are some of the sources of that fear? What are some of the real uncertainties that's surrounding this next generation, next evolution of internet? So, and how companies should think about it? No, these, these are really good questions, Francis. And I, I think the answer to the, to the question on uncertainty is really twofold. First of all, like how can I, as a corporation, know what areas are right for me? And then how can I maximize my success in those areas? Or to put another way, you know, how can I make sure my bets are the right bets? You know, some of this uncertainty is inevitable as we start to explore this new technology boundary. You know, I like to use the analogy when we first uh, started to use uh, cell phones or the mobile revolution. You know, initially, this device, we were you know, used almost exclusively for talking on. I, I remember getting you know, a, a whole 20 text messages per month. And when I was offered another 20 text messages, it just blew my mind that I would ever need 40 text messages each month. And yet nowadays, we touch our cell phones over 5,000 times per day. It's, literally the first thing I pick up in the morning and the last thing I kiss before I go to sleep each night, you know, and whilst I still occasionally use it for talking on, it's actually not its primary usage nowadays. We're kind of at that same point now with the metaverse that we're just beginning to explore some of those initial use cases and beginning to understand some of the, some of the kind of initial ways that we can be successful. But where this goes, I mean, it's just literally going to be kind of limited by, by the power of our imagination. The second area I feel around kind of the fears and unsound uncertainties is this kind of like, to quote a famous movie line, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think we really need to understand what the ethical implications are, what the rules of the road, so to speak, with this, with this new technology. The amount of personal data we're going to be able to collect is going to be exponentially greater than we've ever had with the cell phones. We're going to have detailed biometric information on you know, your 24-7 of each person, eye tracking, and a whole host of other factors. We really need to think of these things now uh, up front and start to build in this kind of like ethical rules. And this is going to be one of the core fields of play we as a firm are really focused on right now and have multiple active projects going with clients who are starting to, to look at some of these kind of ethical implications. Um, but to answer the other part of your question, you know, what should enterprises do now? Really jump in and start experimenting, you know, but suggest you bring a good guide with you who knows the trains, the pitfalls kind of, and the path to success. But really we're helping a lot of our clients today start to try to figure out what works for them both in the short term the medium term and then the long term as they kind of start to really experiment and figure out how they can take advantage of this next huge technology revolution mm -hmm. yeah so i would say that um the responsible that what we call the responsible innovation responsible metaverse is hot truly heart of business for us. And with that, Nitin, I would love just for you to comment, maybe it's kind of a, as, as, let's pivot to the second topic around fields of play. 
fields of play, how we define as classes of key use cases for enterprise where we're seeing it's here and now, and we're seeing companies really getting a significant either new revenue growth or operational efficiency gain from actively participating in the enterprise metaverse. So Nitin, share with us some of the, what Deloitte's doing and what you're seeing with the, uh, as you're seeing from your clients. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And it's kind of uh, a really good question because it gets to the heart of uh, how enterprises, organizations, and obviously our clients are kind of uh, thinking of. Frankly, I mean, what I would say is uh, there's perhaps three fundamental kind of business uh, paradigm shifts that we have seen. The first one is around uh, the focus and proliferation of immersive worlds, irrespective of kind of what it is. More and more organizations, and frankly, even we as humanity are getting uh, uh, familiar with as well as comfortable with immersive worlds. We can perhaps credit uh, our own uh, children who sort of got comfortable with it first in an online gaming world, but it's now sort of coming into the world of enterprises and uh, business itself. That's kind of one shift. The second shift is this concept of intelligent operations. It is no longer sufficient to just, to just digitize operations. We have been implementing packages whether those are ERP packages, whether those are customer relationship packages, whether those are basically kind of finance or supply chain or HR kind of packages. We have been implementing these packages for digitizing business operations. Now we are bringing basically kind of AI and machine learning capabilities to bear to not only digitize, but to essentially cognitize these processes. Mm -hmm. And the essence of cognitizing these processes is to introduce a level of intelligence to make them smart business processes and smart operations. That's the second paradigm shift that is kind of taking place. The third is this concept of investable goods. The fact that uh, social commerce is progressing. You take uh, a country like China as an example, as well as uh, South Korea, Japan, and kind of other uh, let's say kind of countries in uh, East uh, Asia in particular, we have actually seen, frankly, how social commerce has been advancing in those societies. And now it's kind of happening in the Western world too. This concept of basically social commerce, this concept of kind of getting comfortable with uh, every good is investable, whether it is in the physical world or whether it is in the virtual world. You sort of take those paradigm shifts that are taking place with respect to immersive worlds, with respect to smart, intelligent operations, with respect to investable goods, it is frankly creating a very broad field of play uh, with respect to the metaverse. What are those fields of play? One is around this concept of X reality. Reality could be in a physical world, reality could be in a hybrid world, Reality could be in a virtual world. Reality now transcends just the physicality and the location that we are in. That is kind of one uh, aspect. You take, for example, uh, sporting events that uh, we um, all basically kind of love and participate. Those sporting events are both physical as well as you are going to start seeing those sporting events in a virtual world you will basically kind of see experiences with respect to either the Olympics or any other major event, whether it happens to be kind of the football or the soccer World Cup, depending on kind of which part of the world is and what phrase you use. Those events are going to be both in a physical kind of uh, reality as well as in a virtual reality. The second basically kind of uh, field of play is with respect to enterprise simulation. Mm -hmm. Everything can be simulated. Before any major endeavor is undertaken before we actually kind of make a major investment, we can now actually simulate that physical world. We can simulate the impact of that investment and we can essentially kind of test out our hypothesis before we actually undertake the actual initiative. A great example of it, frankly, is uh, playing out 
in Victoria in uh, Australia, where that particular kind of state government as working in uh, concert with private players has essentially has been advancing the cause of how to bring simulation into bear with respect to traffic flow, traffic pattern, as well as uh, how to basically kind of emergency, resp uh, 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 emergency responders actually kind of uh, respond to a particular event that may have taken place. Uh, how can they get to basically that particular uh, uh, spot or a uh, emergency kind of location in a much faster way than perhaps they had been in the past. They're looking at uh, ways of optimizing the route. They're looking at ways of accelerating the time and they're looking at ways of enhancing the experience uh, associated with how the emergency responders come into play. That's an example of actually simulating the physical reality and kind of optimizing the physical world and the responsiveness and the experience that is created. Another field of play is with respect to virtual goods and ventures. Um, there is uh, news that we would have all kind of read around the first digital sneaker that was launched by Nike. That was not by Hapstance, that was by design. It's a recognition of basically this uh, paradigm shift that I talked about with respect to investable goods. Um, you not only have a physical sneaker, but you also basically can invest as a person in a digital sneaker that can then be worn by your avatar from one gaming platform to another. That is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the virtual goods, virtual commerce, and virtual ventures would look like. The next one is with respect to uh, how we work, how we learn, how we absorb, and how we experience the workplace. I talked about it a little bit in the context of uh, the B2E experience that is being uh, created. But immersive learning is going to be a big trend. All of us essentially learn and absorb and understand uh, in different contexts, at different rates, and in different settings. There's no basically kind of one formula. And uh, more and more companies are going to find that uh, they can essentially kind of mix physical learning with immersive learning to create a very differentiated experience as well as to accelerate the whole learning process itself. And that is going to give rise to questions as it relates to what does it do for the culture of an organization? What does it do for human connectivity? And what does it do with respect to how humans actually kind of interact with each other? And then finally, the fifth uh, field of play that I would kind of uh, highlight, which is perhaps absolutely critical because it underpins everything that I kind of uh, outlined and perhaps was also the essence of what Alan uh, outlined, which is trust and resilience. We've got to have trust in how the data is going to be used. Who has access to the data? We have got to basically have trust in the immersive world that our avatars are going to be in. We've got to have trust in the simulation and the systems need to be resilient enough because if we are going to make a bet with respect to kind of virtual worlds, that bet needs to pay off in the physical world itself. Mm -hmm. Trust and resilience is the underpinning and the foundation on which Basically, the whole house stands, and we need this to be a robust house, not a house of cards. So that is, that is kind of what I would uh, highlight, uh, Francis, as to the broad swath of field of play that is in front of us. Right, as of the five fields of play, and those are pretty exciting spaces. Now, I kind of, as I was thinking about the fields of play, it's interesting that, um, Jessica, the uh, you the, the portfolio that you lead across tech, media, telecom, and sports. So you're both on the supply side and also on the demand side in the industry. So share with us a bit in terms of what are you seeing across those fields of play uh, from your clients? 
Thank you, Francis and Nitin. Amazing work breaking it down into those five areas. Trust me, we don't want to have a house of cards. So an unlimited reality can't just immerse you in a digital world. For reality to be truly unlimited, it must be bi-directional. Feeding the digital world with signals from the natural world to simulate infinitely more complex scenarios that produce actionable results. Unlimited Reality and Dimension 10 Studios are going to use digital twins to enhance our cities, our homes, and even our bodies. So what is a digital twin? A digital twin is a living replica of a physical environment. In its optimal state, it lives and breathes just as its real world counterpart. And it's all about the data. Data running from sensors that are all over a connected physical world. It's those machines, our phones, that Alan so eloquently showed, <laughs> that get text messages and all kinds of things through them. Our cameras, which by the way, in many time, cases are on our phones. Our temperature sensors, that, et cetera, et cetera, that are, are feeding the digital twin information. This is what we mean when we talk about the internet of things. The more sensors, the more data, the better the twin gets and the more informed our decisions in the physical world can be. So twins can streamline and enhance this design process. They create time and space for more design iterations and speed to production by removing cycles of prototyping testing. Digital twins are being used today to explore space, optimize manufacturing systems, generate renewable energy more effectively, and even undertake patient surgery more safely. And they are about to get even better. Why, you might ask? Because with a digital twin, engineers can build 3D simulations that incorporate data in real time to determine and modify product specs with more precision much earlier in the design process, while handling exponentially more variations and constraints. The next generation of digital twins will help engineers identify potential manufacturing, quality, and durability issues, all before the designs are finalized. It accelerates prototyping and moves products into production more efficiently and at a lower cost. Ultimately though, leveraging the potential of futuristic industrial manufacturing requires pulling this powerful idea out of the factory and into every aspect of our world, helping humans more effectively and beneficially traverse vir virtual and physical realities. Can digital twins really make organizations smarter? We believe they can because at the end of the day, the digital twin will help people make more informed decisions to create and use products and services more efficiently and effectively. Deloitte, through the unlimited reality practice and partnerships with NVIDIA and the Omniverse platform, is creating digital twins that will proactively guide us, protect us from harm, and help us to use our most vital and increasingly threatened resources more efficiently. I'm gonna to talk to you about two different ways that we're using digital twins and we're challenging our people and our partners to find hundreds more. Mm. Let's start with an easy one, smart factories. Smart factories are not new, but here's how we're accelerating the concepts of digital twins within them to help solve real business challenges like increasing capacity and predicting maintenance, not just improving product design. Deloitte has a smart factory in Wichita, and it's helping businesses see next generation solutions. During the pandemic, as demand for services grew exponentially for one of our clients, a large logistics provider, they called on the smart factory to help them create more capacity without additional facilities or infrastructure. So again, more capacity with the same facilities and infrastructure that they already had. The solution was, we put together a pilot project that incorporates IOT sensors to help predict maintenance failure, failures before they happen and ensure reliable and on-time deliveries. This facility was op operating 24 by seven, which reduced the opportunity for routine, ma routine, routine maintenance activities um, and led to unplanned downtime for emergency maintenance. The downtime left several hundred million dollars on the table and negatively impacted service delivery. By leveraging IoT and edge computing to fuel the digital twin, Deloitte was able to help reduce unplanned downtime by identifying likely machine failures before they occurred. So again, figuring out when something was gonna go wrong 
and making it not go wrong is all about the digital twin ma magic here. IoT sensors add massive amounts of data into algorithms that alert workers to potential problems such as excessive loads, overheating of equipment, or packages that are coming apart and then could lead to emergency maintenance. Following the successful pilot project, the idea is to scale the program across all the facilities. This impact is massive. Once scaled up, this client will unlock 5% of capacity across nearly 50 automated facilities and save hundreds of millions annually. With maintenance issues minimized, they are also able to provide better service to customers despite the pandemic and labor shortages. So it's not just a bottom line impact, but it's also a top line impact because they increase customer, um, customer loyalty, which is really incredibly important. But this is just one example of the ways a digital twin can lead to new businesses and help align people, processes, and assets in a human-centered approach to smart manufacturing. And it will deliver improvements in performance, safety, and workforce transformation. Nitin talked about Australia and what they're doing to unlock this value. We just talked about smart factories and what they're doing to unlock value. Let's now turn to something maybe more sexy or closer to all of us. Let's talk about the digital twins that take that go from zero to 60 as we move into a physical world with autonomous things that move, like cars, cars without human drivers. We're using digital twins to help train these cars. Unlimited Reality is currently at work to make cars safer and more reliable while speeding up the learning process for autonomous vehicles. It's a continuation of the partnership with Formula One Racing on pioneering simulation techniques that allow users to set up scenarios in the digital world to move more safely and quickly test how cars react in various circumstances. Again, it all goes back to data. A huge challenge for autonomous vehicles is the amount of data that flows to and from the cloud and built-in edge components and sensors. They must receive, integrate, and learn in order to make critical decisions in real time in response to their environments. With the creation of a digital twin to run simulations on a virtual test track on an autonomous cloud platform, we can manage and integrate huge amount of, amounts of data with no time lag. We can safely test autonomous vehicles in a variety of situations without involving a human driver or external obstacles like pedestrians, pedestrians, cyclists, or stray dogs. As a mm -hmm. dog owner, that means a lot to me. This will help improve the speed, safety, and costs of bringing autonomous vehicles to market. We are continuing our work with the McLaren Racing on its Formula One cars. We're applying digital twin simulation to improve race strategy and speed and ensure precision. We're bringing together key productive technology in a digital twin to augment, not replace human decision-making. Important stuff, Francis. Yeah, indeed. I, it's, I think I love the uh, autonomous driving and Formula One, um, the, uh, that use case. And in, in, I think that really highlights the power of uh, the exceptional computation together with the whole spatial awareness and experience, experience design. Um, so that also brought me to actually want to ask Alan. Alan, you do a lot of work with the uh, sports associations. Uh, to the extent possible, perhaps you can share a little bit in terms of how that experience part of the equation come to help with the professional league in terms of how they improve not only their own the skills, but also how they improve the fan engagement. No, absolutely. This is actually one of the pieces of work I think we we are in the digital reality practice have been most proud of. Um, the specific example I'd like to talk about is the work we've been doing with the US Golf Association. For the last four or five years, we've been building out virtual reality and augmented reality experiences to really enhance both the experience for the fans at the events, but also for fans all over the world to be able to participate in a whole new way. Um, the AR app that we create builds out a mini metaverse for each one of the golf courses. And then you get to see each one of the players 
in real time hit the ball live across that uh, golf course in, in 360 and 3D and see exactly where the ball lands onto the golf course. Um, so it enables the viewer to not only see their kind of big 2D screen on the wall for zooming in on uh, a particular player, but I get to track whoever I want to on the golf course and then I get to be the director and producer and watch the game how I want to watch the game. So if I've got a particular player that I'm a big fan of, I can watch that player. Or if I'm like, you know, want to cheer for the, the British guy or British woman, in my case, I can again go down and see that individual playing. Um, we're particularly proud because last year we were the, working with USDA. The first time ever we brought an augmented reality experience to a major women's sporting event by not only doing the 18 holes at, for the US Open at Torrey Pines, but also for the US Women's Open at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. And this year, not only are we going to be building out 18 holes again for the men's event at the Country Club in Boston, but also for the women's event at, um, at Pine Needles down in North Carolina. So this is kind of like a whole new way we're, you know, we're a top five app. I think last year we had over 360,000 holes watched over the course of the weekend in 3D. So this is just a, a whole new way to be able to watch sports. And, you know, the Olympics and other major sporting events are just so popular to allow people to kind of view these in, in new ways and um, experience it in a whole new immersive platform. Today, we're using our, our, our smartphones and we're using, you know, tablet devices. But in the future, it's going to be AR glasses that we're going to be able to watch this and see this 360 experience, literally where we can see the players running around. One of the, uh, one of the major league basketball teams this year, for instance, now allow you to watch any game in 360 from any spot on the court so that I can see in live, in real time, literally the players playing in 360 on the court by wearing, you know, right now a VR headset. So I'm really excited about how this is going to continue to develop and you know, become the norm, to be quite honest. Um, mm -hmm. And just how we are going to be watching all sports. I mean, my, my view a little tiny bit has always been that VR or virtual reality allows you to take the best of the in-stadium experience to the home so that I can kind of get that, that sense of being there, being with the crowd, being able to look around. But then AR, augmented reality, allows you to bring the best of the in-home experience to the stadium. So now I can see the yellow line on the football field. Now I can have a little arrow on one of my players. Or if I'm watching a running race, I can see the world record time ahead of the rest of the track. Um, so again, what we're going to be seeing in the future, it's just going to be mind blowing. It really is going to just be so exciting. Mm -hmm. A lot of sports, great sports examples and use cases. And now I'm going to bring up this boxing <laughs> glove. And this leads us to the third topic is the boxing round and three minutes and one minute each. Uh, the question I have is, what glasses enterprises have to break in order to capture the value in the next generation of internet in enterprise metaverse. So ready, set, go, starting knitting. The glass that would have to be broken is perhaps not from a technology perspective. It's going to be from a culture perspective. Culture, acceptance, and how do basically employees and customers think of immersive worlds how do they behave in immersive worlds? How do they interact in immersive worlds? What experiences to kind of create? And consequently, what traits do they actually display as human beings? We certainly do not want to trait, take the, the worst of the traits in uh, kind of uh, manifested by humans in social media, but we want to sort of elevate the experience and we want to create that human connectivity, not only in a, in a physical world, but in a virtual world. That's the glass of culture that would have to be broken. All right, so Nitin's, the Nitin's takeaway for us is challenge the culture to build a better culture in the next generation. Jessica, your take. Well, 
Thank you for the boxing round, Francis. I will say, I was going to say culture, but I think the second most important glass that's going to need to be broken is that companies and organizations are going to need to start thinking about ecosystem plays rather than alliances. Many of these things are, you know, we can be creating these digital twins that are working, you know, 24 by seven, and we don't need multiples of them. So we're going to be creating a digital twin of planet earth. That's going to be, you know, mapping the climate impacts around planet earth. We only need one digital twin likely of planet earth. And so we need to figure out how to use use cases, create use cases that others can use and build that into that, um, into that ecosystem. And you can imagine that kind of cuts across many different um, aspects as well. So not building every, no, not everybody building their very own, but everybody thinking about how they use each other's and come up with great opportunities out of it. Mm -hmm. I love what Jessica just broke. Enterprise, four walls of enterprise. To get the value, you're going to bring in, convene your ecosystem and bring the superpowers to the, 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 to create something that's truly magical, right? Alan, what glasses are you going to break? Uh, it, it's always fun going last because my first two ideas have already been taken. So thank you to my colleagues. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the next thing that we're going to have to be open to is being surprised by what actually works and then what doesn't. Uh, I love the analogy with smartwatches that initially they were a productivity tool. That's how we thought we were going to use them. And then in reality, it's actually become a fitness and health tool. And I think that some of the initial use cases we think are going to be the, the killer apps are actually going to turn out not to be so. And as we kind of get into this and get more excited, um, we're going to just have to be open to just vast possibilities on, on where the metaverse is going to lead us. Mm -hmm. um, very well said. Now, Kelsey and team, uh, Leanne, do we have time for audience questions? I see quite a few questions coming in. Okay, we have questions. Um, so question from Sarah. And by the way, uh, thanks everyone for dialing in and dialing in not only from uh, North America. So we see folks dialing in from South Africa, from Japan, from Australia, from a lot of different places. So thank you all for dialing in. Now, I'm going to pick the uh, question number one coming in from Sarah. Um, Sarah, your question is, what's the most exciting element of Metaverse? Panelists, and Newton, Alan, Jessica, any 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 thoughts? Yeah, I can kind of uh, probably kind of ask. Mm -hmm. The most exciting element is frankly this concept of unlimited, unfounded possibilities. Take any industry. The industry that Jessica, for example, kind of leads. We talked about how the metaverse could come into play and redefine the way that we perceive entertainment. As one example, take the healthcare industry, um, how the metaverse is going to basically be leveraged and thought of in the context of care delivery and surgery. Take uh, the energy markets, how the metaverse would come into play kind of optimize the transition to green energy and kind of consequently, what does a green world look like and what would basically planet Earth be in that uh, context? Take the consumer industry and the movement towards kind of virtual goods and shoppable kind of commerce or take government in terms of the social contract that the government would have with the constituents of the citizens and the type of uh, government services that would be rendered in the actual metaverse itself. It is absolutely the unbounded and unlimited promise, reality, and what basically kind of the world could entail. That mm -hmm. to me is the most exciting element of the metaverse. Yes, and hence unbounded, right? Um, so we have another question coming in uh, the uh, from Anoop. How will virtual reality be redefined as it becomes more interactive. So I think I would love to get uh, take from, from both Alan and Jessica. Alan, I'll tee you up first because you've been doing virtual reality for a long time. And Jessica, I'd love to hear your thoughts after Alan in terms of the whole creator economy that in tech media and telecom and sports, the game, the, the play, to, uh, play to earn, this whole 
culture movement um, is also in my mind is redefining all the um, virtual reality in the hybrid reality here. So Alan, you go first. I, I think it's twofold. Firstly, kind of we look at the consumer world, this idea that we're going to move into a ready player one like experience, you know, wearing haptic gloves or haptic suits and being on running treadmills that are going to allow us to be in these amazingly kind of complex, immersive you know, experiences. And so I think that that's exciting and I think that's going to be really just mind blowing. But from an enterprise point of view, I mean, we're already doing things like um, helping companies to deal with this silver tsunami that is coming in where, you know, you've got a massive exodus of knowledge as the baby boomers walk through the system. And so trying to take that real detailed, comprehensive learning experience and pass it down to the next generations. We're working with a whole host of like power and utility companies to really train up the next generation in a totally new immersive way with virtual reality and you know first of all we take the folks who are kind of at the tail and maturing out of their career get them to really show us what it is that they do and then you know have the more junior folks learn that i mean you know with power companies you touch the wrong thing you get blown across the room and you've got a singed hand so some of these things are incredibly important and i think that you know that type of immersive technology and that type of virtual reality will just become more and more normal. Um, we at Deloitte have you know, made a large um, investment in buying VR headsets to do onboarding and training ourselves at this point. So we're starting to you know, eat our own dog food, so to speak, or drink our own champagne, I guess I'd rather say. Um, so that we're actually like, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and starting to learn and use VR you know, every day, really, to be quite honest. And Alan, taking that to the next level, Francis, you asked me to talk about the creator economy. The creator economy, we could do another an entire session on the creator economy, of course. But the creator economy is democratizing knowledge in a new way and in a more interactive way. And so as creator economy comes together with virtual reality, comes together with IoT and all the things around us, really it is the entree. It is an entree into Web 3.0 or 3, Web 3. I'm been told to never say web 3.0 so i'll have to cut my tongue off after that one but the concept of web you know, creator economy is democratizing content coming in virtual reality is going to make it richer over time and it will continue to be the you know vanguard to, to drive into web 3. so francis that is an entire topic i think we should save that for another day we absolutely will. And there's a whole, the uh, exciting culture moment to unpack. And uh, what's more exciting is technology enable the culture moment, the behavioral shifts and how people and society interact, right? All right. Now, I really appreciate our panelists for your insights. I also appreciate the interaction from uh, the uh, from uh, friends and colleagues and, and also from uh, listeners, uh, viewers today from all different countries. Um, I would also say that this is only the beginning of the dialogue. Uh, we launched this Unbounded as a series and series so that we can share from our lens, from our experiences. And more importantly, we wanted to hear from you in terms of what you see, what are some of the big questions that collectively it's worth pursuing? And what are some of the hopes and fears that you see? Right. Now, just a little plug for the next Unbounded. We're going to do a topic that's pretty cool. It's called to NFT or not to. So hopefully uh, send us your questions to NFT or not to. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Jessica, Newton, Alan, and the whole crew. Thank you.